Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to talk about something I saw being discussed online. It's kind of neat legally, so let's uh, have a look at this. The idea they had is they've got a non-restricted firearm, but they'd rather have it in a, a different configuration that would make it a restricted firearm. But the problem with this is that they don't want to go through all of the hassles involved with a restricted firearm. They don't want to go and, you know, get a an authorization of transport. They don't want to have to go and register it. They don't want to have to do all of these things. So what their idea was is that they could keep it in the non-restricted configuration, drive it out to the range, swap the parts over to the restricted firearm configuration, shoot at the range, you know, all day until they run out of ammunition or get tired or bored or whatever, and then swap it back to non-restricted and then drive it home. And you're saying, you know, that way don't need an authorization to transport because I'm not transporting it. So whenever somebody has a clever idea like this, there's really two possibilities as to what kind of clever idea it is. Sometimes it's a clever idea that lets you avoid some sort of legal restriction and do things that otherwise you might not be able to do. The other kind of clever idea, unfortunately, is the kind that can clever idea your way into jail. And that's really the kind of clever idea that we want to avoid. So let's have a look and consider whether this is, you know, the good kind of clever idea or the bad kind. So the first problem that you're going to run into is with respect to possession of firearm, uh, the unauthorized possession of firearm sections. And that is right here, section 91. Subject to subsection 4, which we don't need to worry about here, a person commits an offense who possesses a prohibited firearm, restricted firearm, or non-restricted firearm without being the holder of A, a license under which the person may possess it. That, I'm assuming, is not a problem. But B, in the case of a prohibited firearm or a restricted firearm, a registration certificate for it. And that's even briefly. So while you're at the range, once you swap that out to be a restricted configuration, now you need to have a registration certificate for it, which is a problem because if a police officer happens to stop you there and wants to check your documentation, you don't have it. Uh, the other sort of issue that you're going to come up here is that there's a, a higher punishment section. Possession of firearm, knowing its possession is unauthorized. I think the Crown would actually have a fairly easy uh, time proving that you knew its possession was unauthorized, given that, you know, given the evidence of you doing this swapping back and forth thing. That sort of seems to be the sort of thing that a judge would take as, uh, as evidence that you're up to something. So you might uh, also run into that, which comes with sentencing enhancements. But that's not the only issues here. And I think these are the less interesting issues as compared to uh, Section 93, because this scenario gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about what your authorization of transport actually does, because it's a little misleading. We hear authorization of transport, and we think what that means is this piece of paper lets you transport it. But it's not actually just an authorization of transport. It's also an authorization to possess the firearm outside of certain scenarios. So we see possession at unauthorized place, section 93. Subject to subsection 3, every person commits an offense who, being the holder of an authorization or a license under which the person may possess a prohibited firearm, a restricted firearm, a non-restricted firearm, prohibited weapon, restricted weapon, prohibited device, prohibited ammunition, possesses them at a place that is A, indicated on the authorization or license as being a place where the person may not possess it, so if, it, if you're specifically forbidden, or B, other than a place indicated on the authorization or license as being a place where the person may possess it, or C, other than a place where it may be possessed under the Firearms Act. So, if you have one of these firearms and, you know, normally you're allowed to just keep it at your home or your approved place of storage, your authorization to transport is actually also an authorization that allows you to have it at, you know, a place that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So you'd actually need to have that authorization to transport 
to have that firearm at the range, notwithstanding the fact that it might have been lawful for you to drive it to the range because it was in a non-restricted con configuration and lawful for you to drive it back once it's in the non-restricted configuration again. But you actually need that authorization to transport the entire time you're at the range. So this is not a great plan. This is the second kind of clever idea, the kind of clever idea that just gets you into some potential trouble. So what do you do about this? What is the better way of going about this? Well, what you probably want to do is get in touch with the chief firearms officer and just register the thing as restricted. It's probably going to be a lot easier for you in terms of that. And you don't ultimately want to run this risk of potentially getting caught and charged. The penalties for violating the firearms provisions of the criminal code or, you know, or the other provisions are just so high. And amongst other things, they're very likely to come with a firearm prohibition. So you don't really want to mess around with that. Um, this is a clever idea in the way that it might clever you into jail. So I cannot recommend it at all. Anyway, I thought I'd comment on this one. It's one of those things where you see people having a discussion and you go, hmm, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thought. Unfortunately, doesn't really work out here. So thank you for watching. This is a bit of a short video, but it's, it's nice to have some shorter videos. Um, I'm working on a bit of a longer one, but that's going to take a little bit of time to get through. Uh, thank you once again. I hope you uh, enjoyed this. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Jason Elliott, Canada's National Farms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited, and at the $20 level, Dale Nesbitt and Cameron Johnson. Also, a number of you at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you once again, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.